For so many years, the tax-paying patriotic citizens of Zimbabwe have been wondering where and how their taxes have been used over the years. This has largely been the case because there has been limited proactive interventions by government to share information on how money generated through payment of taxes has been used. The coming in of the Second Republic has seen transparency and accountability being incorporated into day-to-day -day running of government business. This documentary has therefore been put together to showcase some of the projects that government has been working on over the years using resources that have been generated through taxes and levies paid by our patriotic individuals and corporate citizens. The nation of Zimbabwe has been very unfortunate in recent years as multilateral lending institutions have been shying away from extending financial assistance to the government of Zimbabwe. Most notably, this has been as a result of some unjustified economic and political embargoes that have been unilaterally imposed by Western governments on Zimbabwe. This led to the stalling of a number of projects which government has been working on, with a number of them running behind schedule. However, it was not all doom and gloom as government embraced with both hands the concept of domestic resources mobilization, which in itself is seen as the vital cog for African Renaissance. Domestic resource mobilization, which is defined as the process through which countries raise and spend their own funds to provide for their people, has been instrumental as the Second Republic has managed to work on and complete projects using domestically generated resources. In March 2019, Southern Africa was hit by a tropical cyclone rated amongst the worst ever experienced in the whole continent. This was Cyclone Idai, which originated from the east coast of Mozambique and swept through Zimbabwe and other neighboring countries, leaving a trail of destruction, including loss of human lives, crops, and wildlife, including infrastructure. The government of Zimbabwe took it upon itself to ensure roads and bridges which had been rendered impossible were immediately rehabilitated through the engagement of local road construction companies. The 83-kilometer stretch from Wengezi to Chimanimani was literally impossible after the road network and bridges were ravaged by the cyclone which affected more than 270,000 people, leaving 341 dead and many others missing. There is uh, empirical evidence uh, which uh, indicates that uh, uh, any economic um, uh, development um, is actually led by infrastructure development. Um, and, and this is actually reflected in the Zimbabwean economy by what we've been able to do, uh, as you rightly indicated, on the dam construction, uh, road construction, but more importantly, the rehabilitation uh, of uh, Chimani Mani and the surrounding areas after the impact of uh, Cyclone Idai, where we have actually gone in under the theme building better. So uh, we have been able to, 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 to resuscitate uh, most of the infrastructure, most of the, the services by building better roads, by building better bridges, by building uh, better houses. Uh, and uh, that project is now almost coming to, 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 an, to an end. But we are, we are very, very, very happy with what we have been able to, 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 to achieve in, in, in Chimani Mani. In the Chimani Mani district, we are very grateful to the government that after the advent of uh, Cyclone Inai, a lot of infrastructure was uh, uh, destroyed. We have our stretch from Wengezi up to here to Chimani Mani. All the bridges which are there were destroyed by Cyclone Idai. And uh, as we speak, the government have assisted us and ensured that all the bridges are uh, repaired and constructed. They are now all possible. Uh, we would want to thank uh, our government for the intervention. Uh, the same road from Shimani Mani uh, up to Engezi has been repaired.
Isuzu no dongo tendo government tiedu ne basa rahayaka ita kose rahasa kati batsi roguti tuwa no access this area chimani man yaka zara ne ma boarding schools saka panga pasi na access. Government engaged a number of partners who came in to assist with the different stretches of the of roads. When the JRG, which is which is working on Wengeze up to Skyline, and they are now finishing off the bit at Skyline, where they are widening the road so that it is. Uh, clear and it is is possible. We wanted to thank the government for that. Uh, Masimba was working on uh, the skyline to Chimani Mani, and uh, all the works have been done uh, through the assistance from our government. We also have uh, construction works which are currently going on in the district. We are very grateful that we now have a copper to Jopa, which is uh, 21 kilometers, which is being put under tar uh, by the government of Zimbabwe uh, as a response to Cyclone, uh, Cyclone Inai. Look, I, I think all these projects are largely funded by, by government. We have worked with other uh, 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 friendly uh, and, and, and nations who have actually supported our infrastructure development, but most of them, we have funded them our, directly ourselves as, as government. But, but this is also a reflection of increased re revenue collection uh, 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 by the revenue authorities, Zimra. We have actually done extremely well in ensuring that we do have regular revenues to fund our, our, our project. We have actually seen a year on year real growth in, in, in revenue collection. Uh, so this has actually created the, the platform for us to be able to fund some of these projects uh, by ourselves. Some of these projects naturally would have preferred them to have different funding models. But again, the, the, given the importance and the necessity of some of those projects, we have had to strike a very good balance uh, 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 between our recurrent expenditure, what we spend on operations, what we spend on salaries, but more, more importantly, what we spend on the capital project. But we, 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 the, 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 the revenue streams that have been coming from Zimra uh, have enabled us to, 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 to fund most of these uh, capital projects. This will go a long way in ensuring that uh, economic activity takes place within the district. We have got a lot of farmers in the uh, Rosito Valley who are into banana production and fruit production in general who need their uh, produce to go to the markets as fast as possible since they are perishables. So the completion of this road, which is almost over 90% complete, will go a long way in ensuring that uh, that economic activity is enhanced in Shimani Mani district. So we are very grateful uh, of all the interventions that have been done to date in response to Cyclone Eli by our government. We also have uh, infrastructure in schools, that is social uh, infrastructure in schools and clinics uh, that have been repaired or toilets that have been built uh, by the government to ensure that there is uh, sanitation facilities in our schools. Uh, all that uh, work is money money. We are very grateful. We thank our government for the intervention. Meanwhile, government has intensified efforts to rehabilitate the Bight Bridge Arari Churundu Highway, where significant resources have been channeled. The project, which consists of phased rehabilitation and widening of the existing road, will see it being expanded from the current 7 meters to the Southern Africa Transport and Communications SATCC standard of 12.5 meters width. In an effort to reduce road carnage, in his 2021 national budget presentation, Professor Mtulin Mube said, government will prioritize road development under the National Development Phase 1. This has seen significant progress on the highway, which has exceeded its 20-year lifespan by 40 years, with many lives lost in recent years due to bumps and potholes.
a road is an economy. Uh, when you build a road through an area, when you, you rehabilitate the road, you also add feeder roads onto it, service stations, stations along the road, you are creating an economy around that road. So quite clearly, investment in the uh, Bide Bridge, uh, Harare to Chirund Road is an investment in any piece of, of economy be, be being that road, and it's quite stimulatory. And it's stimulatory in many ways. Uh, first of all, it's about the contractors. Uh, we're using local contractors uh, to basically build the road. There are currently five of them who are competing, and they're doing an excellent job as they compete uh, and they're really delivering their pieces of, of whatever they're contracted to do on time. And, and, and then secondly, you can imagine the impact on, on terms of materials that are sourced uh, uh, for, for, for the road construction, where they're looking at quarry stones, they're looking at cement, they're looking at whatever they're using to build these roads. Uh, the road, it, that is all stimulatory uh, to the economy. They are creating jobs. A lot of jobs have, have been created. And, but it also is building skills locally in terms of the, of the contra construction sector. So that's one area of the direct impact of the road in terms of the, the contractual arrangement. The other area is, the, is this issue of the road being an economy that drives the local economy. If you feed the roads, which we do along the road, it stimulates the economy uh, uh, along that road. Uh, you will find that it makes it easier for people to get to clinics, for children to get to school, for farmers to sell their produce where, wherever they wish to sell their produce. It just improves the life rules of people along that, 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 that road. The third area is in the cost of doing business because uh, trucks carrying uh, raw materials, carrying inputs to industry are getting there faster because the, the, the road is a good road. Cutting down on time and, and time wastage it improves the, the, the cost of do, doing business, or rather reduces the cost of doing business. And that is a, 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 an important and a positive uh, thing to, to, to happen because of the road. The last area is just in bolstering what you call the transit economy. Uh, this road is also a transit road uh, that links you know, uh, sources of raw material and goods from especially South Africa and the rest of the world. So through Zimbabwe onto Zambia, DRC, and other countries to the north. So we need to maximize on economic value of this transit economy. And a good road such as the Chirundu, Harare uh, uh, to Bidebridge Road helps with that. It bolsters that um, uh, transit economy. Causeway Dam is one exciting project recently completed by the government of Zimbabwe, where small scale and commercial farmers are to immediately access water for various farming activities. The expansion of the dam came when government is on the drive to provide water security around the country. However, small-scale farmers will utilize the resource immediately for irrigation purposes, while some commercial farmers are yet to secure funding for center pivots to improve their farming activities. Um, the Causeway Dam is an exciting project that the government has recently uh, completed well, is in the process of the final stages. Um, this month it's spilled for the first time. Um, it's on a very good river, the Macheki, and it is a very large amount of water that is going to benefit the area in many ways. Um, unfortunately, the land surrounding the dam is not really enough to utilize the water that's available in the same extent. So further development of pipelines to access land further away will be necessary. Um, Zesa still needs to come and realign a few of their um, transformers and Zinwa needs to sort out a lot of pipelines and make sure that the different pumping stations are in place. But the potential is big and the area is, um, will benefit enormously. But its serious uh, agenda needs to be addressed. What is commercial and what can be run in a commercial large-scale setup and what can be run as small-scale and small-scale projects that are effective and all providing good income to the various operators. The expansion and completion of Causeway Dam brings more business opportunities, which include fishing and recreation activities, to people from far and wide. To have wholesale sort of poaching of fish, etc., is not going to be very wise. 
So it's a dam that needs to be managed well in order for its full potential to be realized. But it's a very exciting piece of um, development that Zimbabwe has done in these times. And it's an exciting um, dam in the sense that it's on a very strong river and it's very good water. It's filled in less than, it's filled partially last year in a severe drought. And this year it's filled to capacity. All right, it's been a good rainy season. Before the expansion of Causeway Dam, local farmers at Machiki Irrigation Scheme used water from Mucheke and Nyagombori rivers, which would sometimes dry up because of their lack of capacities to sustain farming activities throughout the year. Mashuru umo taishansa ma river mairi, taishansa mucheke river, tishandisa nyagombori river. Asi zai zoi tiga nzoku tinzisi zai zombo umi rwa zoku pera mvura zai zoshia chaku diri dis. Asi Paris juno paka zowa kwa kuzoi dem, aiyo mvura taakui wana tura au disisi. And Lock, a local commercial farmer, speaks on how they are benefiting on the expansion of Causeway Dam and their plans to further develop their farms. He speaks on the need to invest in piping systems for the benefit of farmers surrounding the water source and even beyond. The water that is available from Causeway Dam cannot be utilized by the surrounding farms only. It is, far, it is a far larger project than that. It's an exciting project, but now that the dam is built, infrastructure needs to be put in place to utilize the water that's available. And what is going to be needed is transformers, electricity lines, pumping stations, all which will require finance. The concept of domestic resource mobilization is critical for the financing of the National Development Strategy 1 for the period 2021 to 2025, particularly around infrastructure investment and infrastructure development. Uh, this domestic resource mobilization uh, it looks into basically how we can raise resources from uh, domestic taxes, uh, be they corporate, be it VAT, be, they, be it the 2% tax and other taxes. Uh, they, that's one area. The other area is in deepening capital markets for raising of, of debt financing in the form of, uh, of bonds, for example. So, so all that constitutes domestic resource mobilization, and this is critical for supporting infrastructure uh, development. It's very important that developing countries such as Zimbabwe focus on domestic, domestic resource mobilization. It deepens capital markets. It uh, strengthens, strengthens the financial sector uh, of a country uh, like, like, like Zimbabwe. And it also reduces reliance on, on donor funding, which really is, is, is a gift from other taxpayers uh, resident in other countries. It should be about raising resources from taxpayers within a specific country. So I really urge everyone to pay their taxes on time and, and be compliant because raising these domestic resources is critical uh, it, it, for, for financing infrastructure. Gwai Shangani Dam construction is part of the Greater Matabelele and Zambezi Water Project that was identified in 1912 as a long-term solution to the perennial water challenges faced in Matabelele and North, South, and Bulawayo provinces. The dam is expected to be the third largest inland water body in Zimbabwe and should be completed in December 2021. The project has so far employed 350 people, a number expected to double for its completion within the December 2021 deadline. Uh, Guayishangani Dam is uh, a gravity arch dam basically being constructed to supply potable or drinking water to Blawayo, which is uh, about 251 kilometers from this site. Gwaishangani Dam forms the first phase of uh, the National Matebelele and Sambezi water project. The second phase being the pipeline, which forms the 251 kilometers from, from this dam site. So basically our full supply level is at level 906, 906 meters uh, in relation to the riverbed level. That's uh, the point where we are around uh, 70 meters from the riverbed level. So um, right now we have placed about 33,000 cubic meters of concrete 
on the demo and uh, the apron section combined. Currently, we are cleaning the, the surface uh, in preparation for placing another layer on top. No, Gugwanshakane is a very critical uh, project in terms of ensuring that we, 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 we provide a, a, a clean uh, and regular supply of water to the Matabene project. The project is still earmarked for completion this year. Um, I think last month, we also had an opportunity to have the groundbreaking ceremony for, 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 for the water conveyancing system that will actually take the actual water from Guayashangani to the people of, 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 of Bulawayo. So, so we, 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 we are looking forward to completion of the project uh, uh, this side of, 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 of the year, and, and, and that the, the, the water conveyancing uh, project will also be completed in line or aligned to the completion of the Guay Shangani Dam. A few kilometers southeast of Chivu town lies the government-funded Chivu Dam, which is under construction after the finance minister, Professor Mtulingwe, allocated 41 million US dollars for its construction. On completion, the dam will benefit residents of Chivu town and surrounding farms. The dam has a holding capacity of 26 million cubic meters of water and is expected to be complete by December 2021 after postponements following delays induced by COVID-19 national lockdowns. Uh, Chivu Dam is financed by government. The project is supposed to be complete. It started in August 2018 and was due for completion in uh, December 2020, about two years. The volume of earth to be constructed here is of the order of about half a million cubes, which is about 500,000 cubes. And um, it's quite a challenge because in the remaining time of construction, we are looking at about eight months of working time. And that presents a very tight working program. Uh, to achieve that, we are planning to do a 24-hour working day all the way until the dam is delivered. According to governments, there will be an irrigation scheme downstream while the other side will cater for tourism facilities where people are expected to visit for recreation purposes. Chivu town is a growing town and um, the current water supply is overwhelmed so the supply cannot meet the demand and the solution was to build a bigger dam and a bigger water treatment plant. As we speak, um, construction, what you see on the background is uh, foundation uh, treatment, uh, which is the foundation trench, what we call the core trench, uh, which we then grout with cement to stabilize and uh, improve on its integrity. Chivu Dam has got a capacity of uh, 26 million cubes, um, which will be channeled through a pipe, uh, distributing to a water treatment plant on this location, and finally pumping the water to Chivu Town. It will also have a provision for irrigation uh, for the farming community on the left bank of uh, Sebakwe River. Uh, the dam itself is an earth dam. Uh, in simple terms, it's constructed of gravel. Um, to make it impermeable to water, the central part of the gravel construction is what we call a clay core, which is impermeable to water. So the heart of the dam is made of clay. And then the clay is supported on the upstream and downstream with a gravelly material, which we call fill. Uh, in terms of uh, flood control, to avoid overtopping an F dam, we have a spillway which is located beyond the hill on the left bank uh, to take care of flood waters. So when we have uh, excessive flow in the river, or we have a flood occasion, the water spills on the left side and back into the Sebagwe River, ensuring the safety 
of the structure. The dam has a holding capacity of 26 million cubic meters of water and is expected to be complete by December 2021. About seven kilometers west of Murambinda Growth Point lies the multi-million dollar government-funded Marovanyati Dam commissioned by President Emerson Mnangagwa in November 2020. The dam provides water for domestic, agricultural and industrial use after the Minister of Finance released funds for the completion of the dam in 2017. The completion of the dam also highlights government's investments in key and strategic water bodies around the country and represents a significant turnaround as economic reforms have enabled government to free up resources for capital projects. Currently, projects around the water body are already transforming lives and fostering reliable access to water for communities where the impact of climate change is being intensely felt. The dam is providing water to Murambinda irrigation schemes and Murambinda growth point and is expected to supply two more irrigation schemes. The supply of water into the industrial areas is also expected to drive development in terms of increased productivity. Marovanyati Dam has a holding capacity of 50 million cubic meters, which experts say will always have adequate capacity to meet demand. <laughs> Four hundred and twenty. Urefu Waru Height Rine thirty five point two. Woodzamu Wemvura Richingera Zara Rine twenty eight point two. Maroanyati Rino Diza Madrid Zero Aneta one thousand three hundred hectares. Paris Zino Rino Diza Murambinda. A Uye Nogupa Murambinda Growth Point Vura. Following the urgent call by His Excellency, the President of Zimbabwe, to rapidly transform and modernize the economy through technology-based interventions in line with global best practices. The government undertook to establish science parks or innovation hubs at all state universities as well as industrial parks in all the 10 provinces of the country, a facility that has been embraced by higher and tertiary institutions to date. This endeavor will provide the necessary infrastructure to nurture the translation of knowledge generated by universities through R&D into goods and services, contributing to sustained socio-economic transformation and accelerated growth. Midland State University, in response to uh, the national ambition uh, and the Vision 2030 agenda, has established the enterprises which are made up of several units. We established enterprises that are made up of the chemical manufacturing unit, which is within this industrial park. We also have the clothing and textiles unit within this industrial park. Uh, under the same enterprises, we also have our printing, which is the press and publications unit, which is situated outside this by nature of its operations. Basically, our chemical manufacturing unit is the very unit that has been quite active in the production of uh, sanitizers, disinfectants, uh, and the like during the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. But in order for it to be a going concern and to be relevant beyond the COVID era, we have introduced other formulations that we see as exist beyond this situation of COVID. We have started producing a hygiene and sanitary products like a pine gel, foam bath. We are producing dishwashing material. Uh, and it is our wish in the near future to embark on the production of herbicides and insecticides within the same unit. Uh, the shell has been completed and the funds have been provided by the government through our line ministry. And I should say we are quite grateful uh, that our illustrious management and our minister 
have been working very hard to make sure that these things are in place. Lessons on this initiative are drawn from demonstrated rapid industrializing countries such as Republic of Korea, China, Malaysia, Brazil, and many others. Under phase one of this program, six science parks or innovation hubs will be established at selected universities, including the University of Zimbabwe, UZIT, Chinoy University of Technology, CUT, Harare Institute of Technology, HIT, Midlands State University, MSU, Zimbabwe National Defense University, ZNDU, and the National University of Science and Technology, NAST. Uh, the Innovation Hub is within the Research and Innovation Directorate at the University of Zimbabwe, which is under the University uh, of Zimbabwe's Vice Chancellor's Office. The hub is divided into uh, three wings. Uh, the West Wing is mostly dedicated to development of products that require wet lab experiments, such as genomics, microbiology, chemistry, uh, water analysis, and uh, pharmaceutical uh, pilot uh, plant. Uh, the East Wing is composed mostly of uh, labs that are focused on developing products such as electronic components, uh, electrical components, GIS uh, products, uh, software uh, products, um, and related uh, uh, activities. At the back of the Innovation Hub, in the basement, we have a very big uh, uh, workshop that is designed to support any work that is related to structural mechanical uh, engineering. You can bring your vehicle there and you can reverse engineer it. That's how the lab is set up. Some of the key or uh, highlight innovation or setups that we have there is the National uh, Zimbabwe um, uh, genomics biobank which is a facility that is dedicated at curating biological samples of different types from the rest of the country. This facility is supported by a state-of-the-art genomics lab that can do genomic analysis of any different uh, samples from plants, uh, human samples, uh, microbe samples such as SARS-CoV-2 or TB or HIV or it can also be used um, to do what you call Kronda Madzinza in Shona. If you want to really track the uh, heritage or the lineages of our chiefs, you can use that facility to do that. So this facility is accessible to everyone across, across the country. Uh, just have to contact us and we can provide you with the details in terms of how you can access it. Currently, we are hosting about uh, 41 innovators within the Innovation Hub. These innovators are supported by the Ministry of Higher and Tertiary Education, Innovation Science and Technology Development. So these innovators are working on various innovations from different fields such as uh, agriculture, um, electronic engineering, health, um, industrial pe uh, pesticides, um, agricultural engineering. So what we are doing with them is supporting them to develop their innovations to make sure that they are ready for industrialization or for commercialization. Uh, when the pandemic hit us in 2020, we uh, harnessed all our resources, which is uh, our knowledge and technical prowess to attack the pandemic head on. Uh, so we started producing basically sanitizers, to make sure that we mitigate against the pandemic. So here at the plant, we produce uh, various types of sanitizers, the gels, the spray sanitizers in various uh, colors uh, and fragrances. We also produce detergents, which are used to also combat uh, germs and uh, the COVID um, uh, virus as well. Uh, apart from those that we just used to control the pandemic, we also now have uh, uh, diversified to produce a whole range of detergents that are used for household and other, uh, other things. Uh, so in the plant, we have machines that we have developed locally, which we use for the production of these items, the sanitizers, the detergents. Uh, those two machines, basically agitators, 
and uh, the various containers that are used thereof are what we use to produce uh, the sanitizers and the detergents. We have a complement of uh, about 50 people that we work with here who are in various departments. The main departments being the quality check or quality control. In the quality control, we check every raw material that comes in and also every batch of finished product that we produce. This is where we produce the sanitizers uh, and the various detergents. Uh, the, we pack it in uh, these five liters, 25 liters, and various other containers. But the whole process starts on those uh, machines that are um, uh, over there. Uh, so we have two machines here, which have a capacity of uh, making 4,000 liters uh, at any given go. So every, 40, every 30 minutes, we, have, uh, we can produce 4,000 liters of sanitizers or any detergent. The uh, semi-automated machine, which we have here to pick the 500 mils um, and also pick the uh, one liter uh, bottles on this semi-automated. So it's semi-automated because we pack, it fills here, then we place the cap manually on this point, and then we can place the, uh, the cap is tightened on here. Okay, we are at the Invest of Zimbabwe uh, farm. So this project is water supply augmentation, particularly supplying water to the Invest of Zimbabwe campus and uh, the agro-industrial park down there, and uh, part of the supermarket. Uh, this sump, which is around 60% complete, will be uh, supplied water by six solar-powered pumps, which are within the periphery of the university. Then we have two booster pumps that are going to supply water to the University of Zimbabwe, which is about 10 kilometers from where we are standing right here. Each booster pump will have dual supply, a 15 kilowatt motor, which is going to be powered by around 20 kilowatt of solar PV array. During the night, we are also able to pump using electricity. So each pump will be uh, operating on its own, then the other one will be on standby. Uh, we expect to pump around 250 cubic meters per day. Industrial parks linked to higher and tertiary institutions shall be established in all provinces of the country. So far, four such projects have been established at the University of Zimbabwe, Chinoy University of Technology, Midland State University, and NAST. So, so this... Um a factory shell for agro-processing um, has been funded by government through the Ministry of Higher and Tertiary Education, uh, Innovation, Science and Technology Development. Um, <clears throat> and our thanks to His Excellency President uh, Emerson Mnangagwa, our parent ministry and the Treasury, um, Minister of Finance and Economic Development for supporting this initiative. As you see, this is a large room, foot by 20 meters and, and six meters high where we are going to install um, uh, two plants, basically. One for processing edible oil um, to produce um, initially crude edible so so soybean oil, uh, which can be refined into cooking oil. Uh, and the, from the soya cake, there will be another plant that then produces animal feed, um, either through pelletization or just mixing the different um, feeds, um, depending on the requirements, whether it's for chickens, pigs, and so forth. So essentially, um, you see that it's a um, modern plant facility where the walls are, are washable, um, and the floors as well uh, are, are washable, um, and a lot of uh, you know, aesthetic design and uh, sustainable design, whereby you know, natural light uh, gets in. It's a light room, as you can see, a light uh, plant, but um, all the lighting is coming from the sun uh, through the uh, architectural arrangement, whereby you get a lot of sun. And on the rooftop, there will be solar panels, which again will um, support sustainable energy in terms of renewable energy uh, that will be provided um, uh, mainly for light current applications. You saw the place where we are planning to have a culinary hospital. That would be a hospital where you have uh, specialists and super specialists. Uh, the idea being that, you know, we attend to 
all medical problems, but also do some research in experimental medicine, uh, and new techniques in medicine and uh, drug uh, development and discovery. Um, <clears throat> so that Queen Anne Hospital essentially will reduce outbound medical tourism, whereby people don't have to go to India or South Africa for specialist treatment, but also can in future potentially attract inbound medical tourism, whereby people from the region and neighboring countries and all over the world could also come for state-of-the-art medical attention. So within that, there's a cluster of uh, different um, specializations. One of them is the one here, where we uh, plan to have a laparoscopy. Basically, this is um, a unit that can do non-invasive uh, operations for animals and for human beings. So this will be the experimental lab, which we plan to be the center of excellence in Africa and in the region uh, in terms of um, uh, non-invasive medical practice where you can use lasers um, and, and computers and maybe um, eventually robots in, in uh, performing surgery. The other one will be you know, the uh, oral health center, uh, which will be in the avenues. And that would also uh, have a specialization in ophthalmology and um, uh, optometrics. So, so, so I think uh, that's an ecosystem that we are building around the uh, quinary health practice, which is the top end you know, medical attention, which we want for Zimbabweans so that they get it within the country. On industrial parks, CAT has already set a $3 million artificial insemination program, which has the capacity to generate at least $130 million annually while boosting livestock production. The project focuses on reproductive technologies and advancing cattle, artificial insemination and other technologies uh, throughout the country. The funding that we received from government uh, was used to set up a cement station and reproductive unit together with an innovation hub and an industrial um, park. We currently have purchased a variety of high technology equipment for cement processing. Um, we have also sourced a variety of breeds. Currently we have nine beef breeds and three dairy breeds in th under this project, from which we collect semen and distribute it across the country for artificial insemination purposes and improving cattle genetics across um, Zimbabwean herds. What we have also done is to improve or research uh, technologies and research techniques um, in the same areas. One might ask what an incubation and an innovation hub is. Well, this goes hand in hand with the um, Education 5.0 initiated by the government. Uh, so all along it was a pipeline dream until we got a cash injection in 2020 from the Treasury Department of our government. So that's when we started realizing our dream uh, we responded to the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, by manufacture of sanitizer, hand sanitizers. Initially, we would make uh, 10,000 to 30,000 liters of hand sanitizer, depending on the demand. And from there, that's when we, we grew. Uh, we diversified into making other products. We have uh, liquid soap, dishwashing liquid soap. We have uh, disinfectants. One is hydrogen peroxide based, which is friendly to the environment, but still there are people in the market who still prefer uh, the group seven um, based uh, disinfectants. So we also have a hypochlorite based disinfectant. Our research and development department is working on um, May formulating and making um, a foam bath. So look out for that one. What sets us apart is that we are such certified there's a quality control department and a quality assurance department that looks into that before we, we, we put the product into the market. We, are, we also have barcode, uh, barcodes for, for all the products. So I would say that um, we, we are now living the dream thanks to the Treasury Department. Not only did we, 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 we manage to diversify using the proceeds from the sanitizers, we've managed to purchase uh, assets for ourselves, for our department, 
we have an ethanol tank, a 28,000 liter ethanol tank that we store our ethanol for when we're making sanitizers. We also have a reverse osmosis plant right behind me. Uh, the reverse osmosis plant works in two ways. We have uh, two lines actually, one for the process water that we use for, for making our products. The process water does not contain minerals for obvious reasons. Then uh, we also have um, one line for mineral water. So that's also one of our products that we will be adding to the market. The Innovation Hub's concept has seen the Ministry introducing Education 5.0, whose aim is to produce goods and services as opposed to just churning out graduates who have no capacity or entrepreneurial skills to create jobs. The NAST Innovation Hub was officially commissioned by His Excellency President Emerson Mnangagwa in November 2019. Talking about uh, the National University of Science and Technology Innovation Hub, the construction uh, started with the Innovation Hub Phase 1, which has got currently two major clients, who are the Applied Genetic Testing Center, uh, the famous Applied Genetic Testing Center at NAST, uh, and then the Software Development uh, a center as well within the Innovation Hub Phase 1. Innovation Hub Phase 1 could only accommodate, you know, these two major projects, but as NAST, there are plans to build Innovation Hub Phase 2. Phase 2 is now going to be much bigger and larger to accommodate almost all the faculties within the university. We want to debunk the theory that, you know, innovations can only come probably from scientists uh, alone and engineers, we know that social scientists also have some innovations. So as the innovation hub phase two takes shape, we are looking at having a much bigger, you know, space to allow innovators from all faculties, including our faculties of communication and information science and our faculties of commerce, as well as the other engineering disciplines which could not be accommodated in innovation hub phase uh, phase one. So phase two is likely to be very, very a, a huge project, which we look forward to, you know, launching in the near future, so that at least all the innovations which come through the various faculties at NAST do not go or do not fall into what we call the valley of death. We want them to be nurtured, at least to see their potential and, you know, to nurture them uh, out there. And the innovation hub phase two uh, building is going to offer uh, those facilities. I'm sure you remember when COVID-19 hit Zimbabwe. It was very scary for everyone and most people really. And I remember a time when we went around pharmacies and supermarkets all over the place looking for disinfectants, looking for sanitizers, and most importantly, looking for masks and we could not find. But thankfully, we started producing quality disinfectants, PPE, and sanitizer. And thankfully, the disequilibrium between the supply and demand for sanitizer and all other COVID-19 products was um, corrected. So thanks to that, Zimbabwe was able to combat the COVID-19 pandemic more effectively. You'll find that all shops were able to spray people when they were coming in and maintain social distancing and all forms of things. And I must say, we are glad to say that NAS took a part in this. Amongst our customers, we supply the government and consumer customers. And all our customers are very satisfied with our product, primarily because of the quality and the fact that it is affordable. After all, sanitizer has become a basic product thanks to COVID-19. And we are glad to say that we can give the entire country quality at an affordable price. Uh, we've manufactured other products such as uh, uh, disposable gowns for hospital, shoe covers, head covers, and, and, and uh, polypropylene uh, made gowns. Uh, these can be used, especially where there's hazardous chemicals. We managed to get to give our local guys where fumigating um, the offices here. They use that equipment. We've also done face shields. Um, currently, uh, from all that, actually, from all that, from the past sales that we have managed to work with to, to do, we've now started our own 
factory here. As you can see, there are some machines here. This is just one section of what it is that we want to do. The NAST Innovation Hub houses the university's pace setters, including the Applied Genetic Testing Center, AGTC, popularly known as the DNA Lab, which is already involved in groundbreaking national projects. What we do is forensic DNA analysis. Uh, in, in here, we do a lot of paternity testing, uh, people wanting to establish their parentage, and even other relationships, grandparentage testing, uh, sibling testing, and so on and so forth. We, we do that and we service almost every corner of Zimbabwe. People are coming from every corner of Zimbabwe to access this uh, service. Uh, we also do forensic uh, testing for the police. Uh, the police bring most of their samples to this lab for forensic testing, you know, looking at murder weapons, identifying uh, uh, perpetrators of uh, violent crimes such as murder and sexual assault. Uh, we, we do a lot of that. And we have also been involved in a disaster victim identification where we identify using DNA technology uh, victims of mass disasters. You've seen probable uh, accidents where people, road traffic accidents, where people are bent beyond recognition and we come in there to identify their remains. Uh, by comparing them to their relatives and so forth. We, 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 we do that. Now, with uh, COVID uh, befailing us since last year, we then got involved in COVID testing. The so-called uh, PCR test for COVID is basically a DNA test. So what we, we did, we moved some of our equipment here, uh, PCR equipment, to Mpilo Hospital at the National uh, TB Reference Laboratory. That's where we, we moved in because they have a, a level three power safety facility there because we're working with a new pathogen. We wanted to be safe. So we've been testing uh, COVID there. Um, we tested uh, people from uh, Swingo Province, Midland Province, Volawayo, Mat North and Mat South. So all the five southern provinces uh, were bringing our samples to us and we're testing them. Um, up until the, around November, then we said, no, we have neglected our other duties uh, and government had built capacity at the hospitals to, to, to test for COVID. So we then moved back to our base here and we said, no, for us to continue working on COVID, I think as an academic institution, we are best uh, intervening at a higher level than routine testing. So we have designed uh, COVID testing kits, virus transport media, uh, according to international WHO standards. So we'll start manufacturing uh, PCR uh, uh, kits for testing COVID. And we are in the process of uh, buying equipment uh, uh, for, for that. Key central to that is the, what we call a DNA synthesizer. This is a machine that synthesizes short fragments of DNA or RNA, which are used in the PCR testing. These are called primers. Uh, so we're in the process of uh, purchasing that. Uh, the government, through cabinet, uh, through our Minister of Higher and Tertiary Education, have set aside 71,000 euros uh, for this uh, uh, purchase of this equipment. Once that comes, then we'll start uh, rolling out uh, PCR testing kits and uh, virus transport media. Uh, we hope this will help in, 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 in reducing the cost of uh, the COVID tests from as high as 
uh, if we're making these kits locally, we should bring down the cost to between $15 and $20. Manikaland State University of Applied Sciences is a tertiary institution spearheaded by the Midland State University following a mandate by the Ministry of Higher and Tertiary Institutions and is located approximately 10 kilometers out of Mutare along the Vumba Road. Significant progress on the construction of the new higher learning institution is on course with a state-of-the-art clinic and lecture rooms recently completed. Uh, 2018, uh, we had received the one million dollars by then. Uh, so we designed it in house. The clinic projects, which we started in 2018, uh, it comprises of uh, uh, wards for students, the male and female wards the consultation room, the doctor's room, the uh, treatment room, and other ancillary spaces like the x-ray room and uh, uh, autoclaving rooms. So the clinic uh, was completed in 2019 and uh, is partially functional. What awaits is uh, the procurement of uh, the required in, uh, equipmentation of, uh, of the clinic. Then the, we also worked on a, a lecture room block, which we laid foundations in 2019. Uh, the lecture room block has three lecture rooms, a lab and six offices. So at the moment, this lecture room is at 95% uh, completion. We are now currently working on the fitment of the lab and the painting of uh, the walls and uh, 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 doors and other spaces that need to be attended to. Uh, we anticipate, uh, should funding be available, that within the next month, uh, that is end of uh, May, the lab should be functional and the building will be complete. What we have here in the background is a client services center. Uh, it's a, an admissions building where we want a student to be attended to in one-stop shop method. When a student comes in, we wanted to do to be able to do all the payments, all the paperwork to do with their admissions, transcripts, certificates, all of them in one place. We don't want a student to be moving around and wasting time. So here we are almost completing phase one of a, an admissions building. Phase one comprises of uh, 12 offices and a banking hall. Then the phase two will be a double story block with also student affairs and all other departments related to students. Lupana State University has also built multi-million dollar infrastructure which includes male and female students hostels, kitchen and dining hall complex, facilities which will enable students to focus on their studies without the inconvenience of commuting. And this is the first project I'm going to show you, government-funded project. This is uh, student hostels. On, on our right is the female student hostel. In the middle is the kitchen and dining, uh, a state-of-the-art kitchen and dining hall. And uh, on our further right is the male hostels. Uh, the capacity of the building is each uh, hostel is 372 with two students sharing. So each female has got 372, male has got 372 students sharing, making a, cap a total capacity of uh, 744. Um, this project, uh, the female hostel, was completed in 2016. Uh, they were uh, students moving in. 
Um, the, the kitchen and dining was finished in 2017, uh, while the male hostel is still ongoing. The male hostel uh, is almost 75% complete on electrification, but the builder's work is 99% complete. We expect the electrification to be completed hopefully end of May this year. Behind me is a construction site of a new faculty building. Um, because of uh, the nature of the soil that was city, uh, Lupane State University is sitting on, which is basically Kalahari Sands, we've been forced to use pile system for foundations. Uh, seven, 372 piles have been driven into the uh, soil, um, into the ground uh, at about six meter length. Uh, these are to hold up uh, the foundation of the faculty building. And then uh, a faculty building that will house almost um, probably 1,500 students, um, comprising of classrooms, um, lecture halls, theatres, and, um, and even offices. We are now at the staff last lets, um, where work is in progress on the three bedroom staff flatlet, um, which is being constructed by a Chinese company. We, we are at about 70% uh, uh, stage of completion. The contractor remobilized last week um, after a one year absence due to COVID issues. Um, we expect to finish this one in five months time. Uh, obviously that means end of September. Um, these units, we expect another five, four blocks further down uh, making it uh, five, five, three bedroom flat flats. Uh, we have got on the other side a two bedroom flat flat, which was completed in 2018, end of 2018, and staff moved in in February 2019. Those are two bedroom flats. We also expect five, five, another five, uh, four of them. Um, presently, 24 staff members are staying in the in the two bedroom staff flats. We are on course to achieving Vision 2030, that of becoming an upper middle income economy by year 2030. The way we are going to do it is through a, a succession of national development strategies roadmaps, starting with NDS 1, which runs from 2021 to 2025, then followed by the NDS 2, which will run from 2026 to 2030. So on NDS 1, uh, again, you, our pillars that, the, that we've chosen in terms of this roadmap really speak to the agenda of 2030, uh, which is we'll focus on macroeconomic stability, continue on that roadmap, uh, 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 which will result in strong economic growth, growth that is also inclusive, which will not leave anyone behind, that will not leave any province behind in terms of a spatial uh, uh, inclusion. Uh, uh, but also we're looking at infrastructure development, making sure that we can we keep focusing on, on that. It's very critical for growing the economy. Uh, we want to beneficiate our minerals and, and also uh, uh, benefit uh, from, our, from our tourism, maximize the benefit from tourism. We also continue to engage with the rest of, 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 the, of the world. Uh, we will support our agricultural sector, making sure that both the social protection element, being the presidential input scheme of Vuda or Intuasa, uh, which are the climate proof elements or rather climate proof versions of the presidential input scheme. Uh, whether it's a commercial element, those will be well supported to make sure that we improve uh, our agricultural our, our performance. We, again, we, we, looking at the mining sector, we will drive our vision towards creating a $12 billion mining sector uh, you know, uh, uh, economy by year 2023. And beyond that, we we'll probably want to double the size of the mining sector. So we are focusing on those areas that we know will drive economic growth, will drive income levels so that we can achieve upper middle income uh, uh, status. Participation of all citizens in the collection of taxes by the Zimbabwe Revenue Authority will continue to enable the government to complete future projects on time. Professor Mtulingwe once said, we are undertaking a shared journey towards a better and more secure future. The road is long, winding, and at times bumpy, but there is no other way. This is the road to an upper middle income economy, and if we travel it together, 
With patience and purpose, we will realize our vision 2030.